chapter sixteen of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen georgia below charleston in south carolina below cape fear below port royal a great river called the savannah poured into the sea below the savannah past the ogichi sailing south between the sandy islands and the main ships came to the mouth of the river altamaha thus far was carolina but below altamaha the coast and the country inland became debatable probably florida and spanish liable at any rate to be claimed as such and certainly open to attack from spanish st augustine here lay a stretch of sea-coast and country within hailing distance of semi-tropical lands it was low and sandy with innumerable slow-flowing watercourses creeks and inlets from the sea the back country running up to hills and even mountains stuffed with oars was not known though indeed spanish adventurers had wandered there and mined for gold but the lowlands were warm and dense with trees and wild life the huguenot ribot making report of this region years and years before called it a fair coast stretching of a great length covered with an infinite number of high and fair trees and he described the land as the fairest fruitfulest and pleasantest of all the world abounding in honey venison wild fowl forests woods of all sorts palm trees cypress and cedars bays ye highest and greatest with also the fairest vines in all the world and the sight of the fair meadows is a pleasure not able to be expressed with tongue full of herons curlews bitters mallards egret woodcocks and all other kind of small birds with harts hinds bucks wild swine and all other kinds of wild beasts as we perceived well both by their footing there and their cry and roaring in the night this is the country of the live oak and the magnolia the gray swinging moss and the yellow jessamine the chameleon and the mockingbird the savannah and altamaha rivers and the wide and deep lands between though in that grant of charles the second's to the eight lords proprietors of carolina albemarle clarendon and the rest but this region remained as yet unpeopled save by copper-hued folk true after the american treaty of sixteen seventy between england and spain the english built a small fort upon cumberland island south of the altamaha and presently another fort george to the northwest of the first at the confluence of the rivers oconee and okmulgee there were however no true colonists between the savannah and the altamaha in the year seventeen seventeen the year after spotswood's expedition the carolina proprietaries granted to one sir robert montgomery all the land between the rivers savannah and altamaha with proper jurisdictions privileges prerogatives and franchises the arrangement was feudal enough the new province was to be called the margravat of azelia montgomery as margrave was to render to the lords of carolina an annual quit rent and one-fourth part of all gold and silver found in azelia he must govern in accordance with the laws of england must uphold the established religion of england and provide by taxation for the maintenance of the clergy in three years time the new margrave must colonize his margravate and if he failed to do so all his rights would disappear and azalea would again dissolve into carolina this was what happened for whatever reason montgomery could not obtain his colonists azalea remained a paper land the years went by the country unsettled yet lapsed into the carolina from which so tentatively it had been parted over its spaces the indians still roved the tall forests still lifted their green crowns and no axe was heard nor any english voice 
in the decade that followed the lords proprietors of carolina ceased to be lords proprietors their government had been save at exceptional moments confused oppressive now absent-minded and now mistaken and arbitrary they had meant very well but their knowledge was not exact and now virtual revolution in south carolina assisted their demise after lengthy negotiations at last in seventeen twenty nine all except lord granville surrendered to the crown for a considerable sum their rights and interests carolina south and north thereupon became royal colonies in england there dwelled a man named james edward oglethorpe son of sir theophilus oglethorpe of godalming in surrey though entered at oxford he soon left his books for the army and was present at the siege and taking of belgrade in seventeen seventeen peace descending the young man returned to england and on the death of his elder brother came into the estate and was presently made member of parliament for hasselmere in surrey his character was a firm and generous one his bent markedly humane strong benevolence of soul pope says he had his century too was becoming humane was inquiring into ancient wrongs there arose among other things a belated notion of prison reform the english parliament undertook an investigation and oglethorpe was of those named to examine conditions and to make a report he came into contact with the incarcerated not alone with the lawbreaker hardened or yet to be hardened but with the wrongfully imprisoned and with the debtor the misery of the debtor seems to have struck with insistent hand upon his heart's door the parliamentary inquiry was doubtless productive of some good albeit evidently not of great good but though the inquiry was over oglethorpe's concern was not over it brooded and in the inner clear light where ideas grow eventually brought forth results numbers of debtors lay in crowded and noisome english prisons there often from no true fault at all at times even because of a virtuous action oftenest from mere misfortune if they might but start again in a new land free from entanglements others too were in prison whose crimes were negligible mere mistaken moves with no evil will behind them or if not so negligible then happening often through that misery and ignorance for which the whole world was at fault there was also the broad and well-filled prison of poverty and many of the prisoners there needed only a better start james edward oglethorpe conceived another settlement in america and for colonists he would have all these downtrodden and oppressed he would gather if he might only those who when helped would help themselves who when given opportunity would rise out of old slough and briar he was personally open to the appeal of still another class of unfortunate men he had seen upon the continent the distress of the poor and humble protestants in catholic countries folk of this kind from france from germany had been going in a thin stream for years to the new world but by his plan more might be enabled to escape petty tyranny or persecution he had influence and his scheme appealed to the humane thought of his day appealed too to the political thought in america there was that debatable and unoccupied land south of charlestown in south carolina it would be very good to settle it and none had taken up the idea with seriousness since azilia had failed such a colony as was now contemplated would dispose of spanish claims serve as a buffer colony between florida and south carolina and establish another place of trade the upshot was that the crown granted to oglethorpe and twenty associates the unsettled land between the savannah and the altamaha with a westward depth that was left quite indefinite this territory which was now severed from carolina 
was named georgia after his majesty king george the second and oglethorpe and a number of prominent men became the trustees of the new colony they were to act as such for twenty-one years at the end of which time georgia should pass under the direct government of the crown parliament gave to the starting of things ten thousand pounds and wealthy philanthropic individuals followed suit with considerable donations the trustees assembled organized set to work a philanthropic body they drew from the like-minded far and near various agencies worked toward getting together and sifting the colonists for georgia men visited the prisons for debtors and others they did not choose at random but when they found the truly unfortunate and undepraved in prison they drew them forth compounded with their creditors set the prisoners free and enrolled them among the emigrants likewise they drew together those who from sheer poverty welcomed this opportunity and they began a correspondence with distressed protestants on the continent they also devised and used all manner of safeguards against imposition and the inclusion of any who would be wholly burdens moral or physical so it happened that though misfortune had laid on almost all a heavy hand the early colonists to georgia were by no means undesirable flotsam and jetsam the plans for the colony the hopes for its well-being wear a tranquil and fair countenance oglethorpe himself would go with the first colonists his ship was the anne of two hundred tons burden the last english colonizing ship with which this narrative has to do and to her weathered sails there still clings a fascination on board the anne beside the crew and master are oglethorpe himself and more than a hundred and twenty georgia settlers men women and children the anne shook forth her sails in mid-november seventeen thirty two upon the old west indies sea road and after two months of prosperous faring came to anchor in charlestown harbor south carolina approving this georgia settlement which was to open the country southward and be a wall against spain received the colonists with hospitality oglethorpe and the weary colonists rested from long travel then hoisted sail again and proceeded on their way to port royal and southward yet to the mouth of the savannah here there was further tarrying while oglethorpe and picked men went in a small boat up the river to choose the site where they should build their town here upon the lower reaches there lay a fair plateau a mile long rising forty feet above the stream near by stood a village of well-inclined indians the yamacraws ships might float upon the river close beneath the tree-crowned bluff it was springtime now and beautiful in the southern land the sky azure the air delicate the earth garbed in flowers little wonder then that oglethorpe chose yamacraw bluff for his town a trader from carolina was found here and the trader's wife a half-breed mary musgrove by name did the english good service she made her indian kindred friends with the newcomers from the first oglethorpe dealt wisely with the red men in return for many coveted goods he procured within the year a formal cession of the land between the two rivers and the islands off the coast he swore friendship and promised to treat the indians justly and he kept his oath the site chosen he now returned to the anne and presently brought his colonists up the river to that fair place as soon as they landed these first georgians began immediately to build a town which they named savannah ere long other emigrants arrived in seventeen thirty four came seventy-eight german protestants from salzburg with baron von reck and two pastors for leaders the next year saw fifty-seven others added to these 
then came moravians with their pastor all these strong industrious religious folk made settlements upon the river above savannah italians came piedmontese sent by the trustees to teach the coveted silk culture oglethorpe when he sailed to england in seventeen thirty four took with him tama chi chi chief of the yamacraws and other indians english interest in georgia increased parliament gave more money twenty six thousand pounds oglethorpe and the trustees gathered more colonists the spanish cloud seemed to be rolling up in the south and it was desirable to have in georgia a number of men who were by inheritance used to war scotch highlanders there would be the right folk no sooner said than gathered something under two hundred courageous and hardy were enrolled from the highlands the majority were men but there were fifty women and children with them all went to georgia where they settled to the south of savannah on the altamaha near the island of st simon other highlanders followed they had a fort in a town which they named new inverness and the region that they peopled they called darien oglethorpe himself left england late in seventeen thirty five with two ships the simon and the london merchant and several hundred colonists aboard of these folk doubtless a number were of the type the whole enterprise had been planned to benefit others were protestants from the continent yet others notably sir francis bathurst and his family went at their own charges after oglethorpe himself most remarkable perhaps of those going to georgia were the brothers john and charles wesley not precisely colonists are the wesleys but prospectors for the souls of the colonists and the souls of the indians yamacraws uchis and creeks they all landed at savannah and now planned to make a settlement south of their capital city by the mouth of altamaha oglethorpe chose st simon's island and here they built and called their town frederica each freeholder had sixty feet in front by ninety feet in depth upon the high street for house and garden but those which fronted the river had but thirty in front by sixty feet in depth each family had a bower of palmetto leaves finished upon the back street in their own lands the side toward the front street was set out for their houses these palmetto bowers were very convenient shelters being tight in the hardest rains they were about twenty feet long and fourteen feet wide and in regular rows looked very pretty the palmetto leaves lying smooth and handsome and of good colour the whole appeared something like a camp for the bowers looked like tents only being larger and covered with palmetto leaves their life sounds idyllic but it will not always be so thunders will arise serpents be found in eden but here now we leave them in infant savannah in the salzburgers village of ebenezer and in the moravian village near by in darien of the highlanders and in frederica where until houses are built they will live in palmetto bowers virginia maryland the two carolinas georgia the southern sweep of england in america are colonized they have communication with one another and with middle and northern england in america they also have communication with the motherland over the sea the greetings of kindred and the fruits of labor travel to and fro over the salt tumbling waves but also go mutual criticism and complaint each man says goethe is led and misled after a fashion peculiar to himself so with those mass persons called countries tension would come about tension would relax tension would return and increase between mother england and daughter america in all these colonies in the year with which this narrative closes there were living children and young persons who would see the cord between broken would hear read the declaration of independence so but the true bond could never be broken for mother and daughter after all are one End of chapter sixteen
end of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston